Revolver is a great fucking film. Wait, a film starring Jason Statham is one of your favorites? Yeah, it is. The fourth Guy Ritchie film, which is the director's biggest flop ever, is by far one of the most philosophical, psychological, and thought-provoking films I have ever seen. This is my second movie analysis here on YouTube, and just like Southland Tales, the film are doing a breakdown of the flop that hasn't even turned into a cult film yet, as people cannot really see the movie for what it really is. There are three different versions of the film, and I have seen all of them at least twice. There's the original Juki version, released in 2005 that runs almost at 2 hours, and is a lot less coherent than the 2007 US version, which major difference is the ending that makes a lot more sense to an average viewer. The US version is only an hour and 40 minutes long. Finally, there's the Scandinavian version, which is called the director's cut, but I honestly doubt it is. This cut is nearly a copy of the US version, but with a few scenes deleted here and there. The message that Guy Ritchie wants to provide to his audience is clearer in the US and Scandinavian version, but the version he prefers is obviously the original. However, it doesn't matter what cut of the film you watch, this analysis will still make sense if you remember anything of Revolver. But most people who saw the movie at the time of his release batch it for being pretentious and just a film that makes no sense whatsoever, Richie did try to make something very deep. He spent two years writing the script for the movie and if it wasn't released under his name I'm sure it would be a success, like how about David Lynch's Revolver? Well that'd be a hell lot better for advertising. People didn't expect such a serious mindfuck film from the guy who made Snatch and Lockstock and Two Smoking Barrels. Instead of wasting time trying to argument here, let's begin. Time to explain the movie. The first part that we have to go through to get the movie is the human ego, the central theme of Revolver. Here's my short explanation of what it really is. Whatever you call yourself, hence Ludwig, Jason, Ray, that is your ego. Throughout your life, your experiences have helped you becoming who you are. You will react in a way that has already been set due to your ego which has created your prejudices and expectations through our experiences. It is what in the end creates a human addiction of love and hate that we may feel. The ego in fact is the reason humans lose control when they go through a breakup, a divorce or any type of loss really. Once you get married, it becomes so obvious for you that you always have someone you can rely on that when this thing disappears, the ego can't adjust. Therefore, we could say that the ego causes deaths, suicides and finally crimes. So to summarize, we are controlled by this person who is in our head and without he or she, we are just empty bodies starting from level 1. No one in this world can live without an ego, it cannot be defeated, even if it is defeated, it will be built up again. Money and greed is a big part of the film Revolver as well, which is why a lot of scenes take place inside of a casino. Whatever you do in your life, the ego will continue to want more and more and it will not stop. The only thing that can make it stop is the feeling of acceptance and love all around you. Then it will calm down until it disappears. Chess is another activity in the film that we see in nearly every scene. Some people have argued that the whole film is in fact a metaphor for chess, but after watching the film over and over again, I think it's a way too simple explanation of this fantastic universe. When you play chess, your ego has set you free. It does not control what you do and it is perhaps the only game where logic will overshadow your opinions. Keep this in mind because this is extremely important for your understanding of Revolver. Let's go through the characters. Jay Green has just got out of jail when the film starts and wants to revenge on the man who set him there, Dorothy Mecca. The two characters are both hunted by extreme greed in the beginning of the film. As mentioned in the car, Jake has got more money than he could ever spend and has no problems, yet he still feels the urge to do something about an issue that is not even relevant anymore. This is because of the hate that has been created inside of him. Dorothy Mecca is almost the same character when you think about it, at least in the beginning of the film. As soon as Jake Green enters his casino, he wants to meet him, hoping to say a final goodbye. But for what? That is the question. As early as in the beginning of the film, we see signs of Jake's ego controlling him. The ego tells him to take the stairs instead of the elevator as he doesn't like to feel trapped. The one who says this before he does is his mind, which is in fact his ego. He doesn't like to feel trapped as he has just gotten out of jail. The first encounter of Jake and Dorothy is also the first sign of a change for Jake. Dorothy tells him how he's the boss and Jake is simply an employee, another thing created by our egos. 
This is simply about how our social classes and place in life are already set up by our illusions and everybody believes it. We know that Dorothy is a rich man as he sits on the top of a casino around an exclusive table. We know that Jake is not in his position as he is rejected by one of Dorothy's employees at first until he is invited. Dorothy's leadership is shown throughout the film and for him it is extremely obvious that he can control anybody. Just before Jay collapses in the stairs, we are introduced to Zack, who tells Mr. Green that he's in trouble and gives him his business card. Dorothy tells his assistant of sorts, Paul, to order Sawyer to finish Jake off after he threatens Paul, which Dorothy finds ridiculous due to his position. Dorothy's gang tries to assassinate Jake, but Jake is saved as Zack was aware of the incident that was waiting to happen and gets out of the scene. They drive to a chess place of sorts where he encounters Avi, who is Zack's partner. The two agree to protect Jake in the future if he gives them every penny he has. Avi or Avi says one really important thing here, which is that in reality he doesn't have a choice. The reality here is the world that is outside of Jake's mind. As a viewer we may think that he is capable of surviving due to his appearance as an action hero, but really he doesn't stand a chance. The one reason he doesn't want the team up with Avi and Zack is because he has to give all of his money away, which is his ego's biggest fear. He isn't convinced to give all of his money away until it is proven that he may survive for 3 days the most with his current condition. Two use the money to support their firm where they give poor people the opportunity to take loans. Whilst Jake is driving, he reveals a little more about his backstory to build up the reasons why we as an audience should hate Dorothy Mecca. Billy Green, Jake's brother, had his wife shot by him once he was looking for Mr. Green. We see the two later in the film. He was then put in jail after Jake failed to blame the murderers of a gang on Mecca. It is in the next scene that Sam Gold is mentioned for the first time. If Sam Gold is real not, it's up to the viewer, but the most common theory is that Sam Gold is simply the ego. You can't see him, but he sees everything. Did you ever notice this though? The distributor of this film is Samuel Goldwyn Films. Later in Revolver, Avi makes a statement that really changed my mind about Sam Gold being only the ego. I'll get to this later. Dorothy is hoping to meet Sam Gold but can't see him. Instead he talks business with Miss Walker and he promises that a deal we do not know too much about will go through. In the UK version there's a long chess scene that follows, explaining the concept of a con. It's also about Jake's jail time and it is only referenced in the end of the two other versions of the film. We are told that Jake had two cellmates who he never saw the face of, but they promised to escape with him. However, in the end they pulled a con on him and he was left with nothing after they stole all of his money when they got out. The two also knew everything about him. The only thing Jake was left with was the concept of the con, which is the one he has followed since his release and the reason behind his success. The famous quote, you can only get smart by playing against what our opponent also comes in here. The ego enjoys to win, and in the end, when someone is at the top of the game, he or she doesn't think logically anymore. They expect to win whatever they do. However, the newbie will learn from the mistakes he or she makes, and never assume that he or she is going to win nor lose. Therefore, the only way you can get smarter in a game is playing against a smarter opponent you don't stand a chance against. Another metaphor in the film. Jake plays a game against a powerful Dorothy Mecca. Dorothy may be smarter opponent in the way that he has won his fortune, whilst Jake couldn't even escape from prison. Therefore, Dorothy relies on his ego whilst Jake has to find logical solutions to things. After Jake, Avi and Zack manages to steal all the powder from Dorothy, his gang teams up with an Asian one. At this point, Dorothy agrees to work with anyone as long as his business works out. He has failed the deal and becomes incredibly desperate. But once again, Jake, Avi and Zack successfully rob them, this time the Asian gang. During this tense scene at the hotel room, the film switches focus between animation and real footage of actors. What does this mean you may ask? After reading a lot of Guy Ritchie interviews, I have come to the conclusion that it is probably there to showcase the type of egos that control the Asian gang leader, Jake, Avi and Zack, as well as Dorothy Mecca. When Jake and his company enter the hotel room, the animated segments we get to see are nearly cops of what actually happens in the film. When we go to another timeline, however, and we see Dorothy's anger over the robbery, the animation shows an extremely exaggerated version of the reality, where his hair is burning. What we can make from this clip is that Dorothy clearly has power and uses it against Paul. And this is what according to his ego is the reality. Same goes for the Asian gang leader, who is furious about his members not taking care of the business well enough. At first he performs some martial arts before shooting two of his members right in the head. A brutal murder that shows his enormous ego. I know most of you get probably think that I'm just overanalyzing the shit out of this film. 
It's a Guy Rich film, right? Maybe he just wanted to do something fun. But like I said, I have read nearly every interview with him about this film and this is the conclusion that I came to. It should be pretty obvious, actually, that the things that are happening in the animated segments for Dorothy and the Asian gang leader do not happen in reality. Avi and Zack then decide to meet up with the people who failed to pay back their loans and plays around with Jake's ego. When they ask him to shoot the man, they're simply testing the amount of control they have over him. When Avi says, you can't see what's right in front of you, he's talking about how he still hasn't exited his own world and joined the real one. When he instead attempts to shoot Avi, I think he didn't fail the test, but I'm not sure to be honest. I like your interpretation of this. We didn't come to one of the key scenes in the entire film. The Yuki version has a few half necessary scenes to add before that, mostly to introduce us to Billy's daughter and her love to each other. Both the use and Scandinavian version completely cut all the family background scenes with Jake, but to be fully honest, it doesn't make a complete difference when you think about it. The central theme of the film is hate after all, not love. Back to the key scene. This is where the voiceover narrates from Jake, Reilly's ego, starts doubting the entire existence of mankind. It is the first time in the movie where his character breaks the dress code as well and doesn't wear a fancy suit. That is when he realizes how humans are driven by greed and false hope. I have no clue why he's hit by a car and I would honestly like to hear why you think that is the case. The only thing about the scene that I react to was the change of his appearance and he does mention the fancy suit that you have to wear every day in the whole statement. Afterwards he's chased by one of Mecca's employees who accidentally shoots himself while on the run and Jake ignores. When it's explained to Mecca a few scenes later at a dinner he's told a lie that he believes as Jake Green is his biggest enemy. In the UK version there's another scene between which explains what Jake did once he got out of prison. He started to take loans from others and pay them 3% back, which he did for a few years. In the end, the ones he took loans from couldn't afford it, so they asked Mecca for help. Once they couldn't pay Mecca back, he needed answers. Mecca is once again the worst opponent here, as he doesn't think logically. He lends the money and tells them to do the task. Meanwhile, Jake, who starts from the bottom, has to work long and hard to find his methods. This doesn't really add anything to the story in my book, but it's an interesting side note to take. After dinner, there is a shootout that Sora causes, and Mecca still believes that Lord John took his powder. Not Jake, who really did it. Sora then pays a visit to the Asian gang in his order to kill most of the members around here, which he does, and this is where the re revelation comes in on the roof. Basically, what I explained in the beginning is thrown in here, and it is only here where it all becomes clear that Jake's ego has been controlling him the entire time. And that the ego is in fact his biggest enemy. The ego controls our every move, tells us what to do, and we are used to it. This is also where I will continue my theory about who Sam Gold is. He may be the ego, as he's behind all the pain there ever was in every crime ever committed. The one who talks back to Avi in this scene is Jake's ego as well. So yes, most likely it's ego. But it can't be a coincidence that Sam Goldwyn is the company behind this movie. So think of this. Avi says the following. Games. And nobody knows it. And all of this. This is his world. He owns it. He controls it. Possibly Sam Gold is the movie itself. Maybe Garation went so far as thinking about this fact. When we watch a movie, we're often being taught something new or introduced to our opinions. That is exactly what we are in this movie too. The ones with the power to change the material in the film is a distributor or production company. If they want Jake to die, they kill him. If they want their opinions heard, they can show them. Therefore, in some way, every film ever made is some kind of propaganda. Only in this one, the distributor is the antagonist who they never find in the end. God, this is interesting, but a little too far-fetched, I'll admit. Worth thinking about though, especially because you don't see gold, but gold sees everything. When Jake is seated in the car afterwards, he's told that he's still in prison. And this is where the entire movie becomes extremely complex. Is the entire movie just a metaphor for him losing his ego inside of his prison cell? Are not the characters real? Chess is a constant theme in the film, and that is the only thing he has inside of his prison cell. Maybe it's all an imagination. After all, how could he just visit Mecca when he's sleeping afterwards? How would any of this have happened? After watching the movie many times, my conclusion is that most of the stuff we see on screen actually happens. It is also after the roof scene that the US and UK version become two completely different films as the final scenes play in a different order. Firstly, Jake donates a lot of money to charity under Mecca's name. After that though, the US version falls with Mecca reacting to this, meanwhile the UK version cuts directly to the scene where Jake battles his own ego. 
I think the UK version shows the real chronological order of the events, so I'll go with that one. When Jake finally meets Mecha again, his ego tries to convince him to kill Mecha. The voice is aggressive and wants him to die. This is so fantastical done. If you watch the scene carefully, you can figure out who is the ego and who is the real person. The biggest question for most people is why Jake simply forgives him for his stupidity. Well, the stupidity is basically his ego. The ego deserves behind all the hate and crime in this world. But the real Jake realizes that killing him will not do anybody any justice. When a person loses his ego in real life or experiences the so-called ego death, they just don't care about anything anymore. And this is what happens. He has defeated the ego and therefore doesn't feel the urge to kill Mecha. He won! Once he exits, Avi's voiceover says, Wherever you don't want to go is where you'll find him. You guessed it, the elevator. Being in an elevator is Jake's biggest fear, and that is where he finally faces his ego. The elevator scene is just pure brilliance. Jason Statham is really at the top of his game here with his acting, and it's truly compelling when he's having an argument with himself. His ego is about to die, and it tries everything to stay inside of him, but in the end it fails. Because no matter how much it yells at him, he doesn't listen and instead realizes that it's not about him. However, Mecha hasn't changed and never will, and Jake meets him when he exits the elevator. Mecha finds it obvious that anyone should fear him with his enormous power, but Jake, who has killed his ego, has no reason to fear him at all. He is not controlled and instead walks past Mecha, who remains the same position, crying about the power that he has lost. The movie kind of switch focus now to Mecha and his ego as they are fighting the next day, when he loses all of his power and realizes that Jake has perhaps won the game after all. He wants to find Jake Green and send Sorter and his army to find him by the help of Billy and his daughter. Sorter loses his ego in their house and shoots everyone instead but Billy and his daughter. Once again, Dorothy Mecha has completely lost control over his reality and his ego cannot adjust to the current situation. Now we are at the final scene of sorts, at least in the US and Scandinavian version. Jake and Abby play chess for one last time and most of the mystery is explained when Abby finally wins a game. I think this scene shows one gigantic twist that is incredibly hard to get. Abby and Zack were in fact the two other people who were stuck in jail with Jake. Jake talks about them in the beginning of the film, he's two cellmates who know everything about him and the two had the real concept of the con. They teach Jake about everything and then vanish without a trace, having taken all of his money as well. They leave a note, very similar to the one that Jake finds when he meets Zack for the first time. What else supports this fact? In this scene we see both Zack and Avi in the jail cells, reading the same books, playing chess as well. And the only time we see one of the cellmates before is from the back. We have no idea who it is, but now we know, it was the two of them after all. The final proof we have is that Jake finds the car keys that they supposedly have stolen from him. They are given to him by Avi once he wins the chess game. This is where the US version ends, with the simple words, Checkmate. In the credits, we see clips of Deepak Chopra and other life gurus talking about the human ego, making it obvious that this is what the film is about. The original Yuki version continues with Avi saying, We are you. This makes me question Avi and Zack's existence, but I think they are real, and that the twist I just talked about is the explanation. I do not have this confirmed though, so don't mark my words, but this is my explanation. Somehow, when thinking about it, this was the really obvious twist. Of course, Zack and Anne were his two cellmates. How would they know so much about Jake otherwise? Still, it took me about 20 watches to figure that one out. Dorothy, who is taking Billy's daughter, invites Jake who enters with all the money. Mecha absolutely collapses as his ego has taken full control and can't accept his loss. When he points a gun at Billy's daughter, Jake doesn't care, which Mecha's ego reacts negatively to as he wants the attention. Instead of Mecha taking control of himself in the end, Jake simply kills him by taking control of his ego. He hears the thoughts, I'd rather kill myself than let him kill me. Jake can't kill a dead man, so Dorothy shoots himself in the end when his ego finally gives up. In Dad's Revolver, the movie in a nutshell. Wow guys, just writing this explanation was almost as fantastic as watching the movie. I absolutely love Revolver and it's a movie that keeps getting better every time I see it. It's one of the few films, in fact, that examines the true side of the human ego, in my opinion at least. Something that I took a lot of inspiration from when making my recent short, The Ego Death which is set to premiere at several film festivals later this year. It examines the same things, but it's really about a criminal like Jake Green. It's really sad to see that the film died off very quickly and that so few people can appreciate a revolver for what it is. Gary Richard surely wanted to make a huge film content-wise, and he did. 
What I would suggest you to do after watching this analysis is to go back and watch the movie. Maybe get your own interpretation of it. There's nothing that's right or wrong here. The only thing we know for sure is that the movie is about the so-called ego death. The rest, well, that's guesses for me. If there's anything you would like to add, please let me know in the comment section down below. Revolver is a movie that is waiting to be loved. With brilliant performances, a compelling story and a fantastic ending, I can't imagine it being any better than it is.